Uh, he or she says, Hello, Vincent and Charles. I was just out on the veranda eating some grits with leftover crawfish etouffee and listening to the show when Charles mentioned that he was a legitimist. Could Charles explain the arguments for and against each side of the debate over French succession? Well, I'm in the mood, Joe, I'll tell you what. Jambala, crawfish pie, and filet gumbo. Because tonight I gotta see my share of meal. Feel fruit chop, pick guitar, and be gay. Son of a gun, gonna have some fun on the bio. Which reminds me, uh, Monsieur, uh, Mademoiselle, ou Madame Boudreau, if you're Cajun, are you Prairie Cajun or are you Bayou Cajun? You can respond as you wish. Well, it's like this. The uh, House of Bourbon is uh, with the kings of France. Now, the, uh, the main line of the kings of France, the House of Capet, they became extinct. And so a younger branch, the House of Valois, became kings and they became extinct. And they were followed by the next closest, the House of Bourbon, the first of whom was Henry IV. Henry IV had a son named Louis XIII, and Louis XIII had two sons. One was Louis XIV, the successor. The other was Philippe, the Duc d'Orléans. And he was founder of the House of Orléans, Bourbon Orléans. Now, uh, <clears throat> it so happened that uh, Louis, Th Louis uh, XIII's wife was named Anne of Austria. She was a Habsburg, a Spanish Habsburg, despite her name. This was the Casa d'Austria, the House of Austria. Um, and Louis XIV also married a Spanish Habsburg princess, the sister of the last king. Maria Teresa. Uh, sorry, the sister was named Maria Teresa. Maria Teresa. But her brother was Charles II, the last uh, Habsburg king of Spain. So he died. And Louis XIV was able to convince him to leave his throne to his younger grandson, Philip V rather than to his next closest Habsburg cousin, Charles of Austria. The result was the famous War of Spanish Succession, or as we called it in the States, St. Anne's War. The end of the result was that, although the Austrians got most of the European possessions of the Spanish, the Bourbon kept Spain and the Americans. But at the Treaty of Utrecht, they agreed that no one person could be king of France and king of Spain. So that's a rigid law. And that meant that the, uh, the Bourbons of Spain could not become kings of France. The Bourbons of France could not be kings of Spain. So you have the younger house, Bourbon España. All right. Time goes by. Uh, Louis XIV's great grandson becomes the king is Louis XV. He dies. His son uh, predeceases him. Uh, and so his grandson, Louis XVI, becomes king. Louis XVI has two brothers. And he's murdered by the revolution. The two brothers succeed one after the other. Uh, Louis XVIII, who dies without any sons. Charles X. Charles X has a grandson. Henry V of the Count of Chambord, who is the last unassailable, undoubtable Bourbon of France. You with me so far? Okay. Yes. Now, the House of Orléans, that descended from Louis XIV's brother, had played a terrible role in the uh, French Revolution. The Duke of Orléans, Philippe Egalité, voted, he went over to the revolution voted for the king's murder, and then was beheaded himself. His son, after being rehabilitated by Charles X, betrays him and becomes king in his place in 1830, although he's overthrown himself in 1848. So, meanwhile, the Bourbon of Spain 
have gone off in several different directions. Uh, you remember um, Carlos III of Spain, the uh, uh, for the founder of Los Angeles. Of course, of course. How could you not? Well, before he founded Los Angeles, he was the uh, first Bourbon Duke of Parma and the first Bourbon King of the Two Sicilies. And these were all younger branches. So, the, here now are the uh, House of Bourbon in lines of seniority in the year of our Lord, uh, 1830. Bourbon of France, Bourbon of Spain, uh, Bourbon of uh, Parma, Bourbon of Two Sicilies, Bourbon Orléans. All right. Now, here's where it begins to get a little tricky. In 1837, Ferdinand, Fernando VII dies. Now, the Salic law of the House of Bourbon meant that only brothers could succeed. It had to be male. So, uh, normally his brother, Don Carlos, would have been king. But, Fernando VII wanted his daughter to inherit. And before the Bourbon came to the throne of Spain, they had had reigning women. So he changed the law. That was something that his brother would not accept. Now, one thing you've got to bear in mind that just as the, the, the legitimist line of the French house of Bourbon, the main line, when it wasn't just a question with the house of Orléans who had supplanted them as kings, it wasn't just a question of genealogy, but also ideology. Bourbon or Lyon represented liberal monarchy. The legitimate line of the Bourbon represented uh, traditional monarchy. The same thing happened in Spain when they split. The Carlos line uh, stood not just for being the older line, but also for traditional Spanish monarchy. The uh, Cristinos, the junior line, stood for liberal monarchy. All right. So now what do we got? Bourbon, France, the Carlists, the uh, and the Cristinos, the older and lesser and the younger line of Spain, Parma, two Sicilies, and Orleans. In 1883, Henry V, the Comte de Chambord, dies. Now, this is a little difficult. It's a little difficult because the son of, of uh, the usurping uh, Louis Philippe had made things up with the Comte de Chambord, and he was undeniably French. The next senior heir to the, to the French throne was the Carlist claimant, who was, had an on again, off again civil war with the younger line in Spain. So a small minority of the, of the uh, French legitimists declared that he was the rightful king of France as well as Spain. Although he had control over neither. But most of them joined the Orléans. They were the Orléanists. And this was made easier by the fact that Philippe, that being the Orléans at the time, was much more traditional in his approach to monarchy than his father or grandfather had been. All right. Fast forward. Most French royalists support Orléans, but a few legitimists do not. Then the Carlists, the Carlist line, the older Spanish line, becomes extinct in 1936. Well, this leads to a couple of interesting problems. The king of Spain, the younger king who was deposed, Alfonso XIII, had two sons, Don Jaime and Don Juan. Now, Don Jaime was blind and uh, deaf, so it was figured he would never reproduce. They wouldn't have no kids. So his father got him to renounce the throne of Spain, which he did. The Carlists, in the meantime, because of another old law in Spain, which held that any branch of the ruling house who had taken up arms against the legitimate king could never assume the throne. Normally, Alfonso and his descendants would have been the next in line after the Carlists. But the Carlist supporters refused to have anything to do with them because, of, as far as they were concerned, they were usurpers. 
So they looked to Bourbon Parma as the head of the colonists. But those few French legitimists who had been loyal to the head of the colonists switched their allegiance to Don Jaime, the eldest king, uh, the eldest son of the king of Spain, who had given up his rights to Spain, but not France, and who surprised everybody by getting married and having a kid. <laughs> so that kid, Don Alfonso, uh, uh, Monseigneur Alphonse, he revived the legitimist cause in France in the 1960s and 70s. And he was helped in this by the fact that the Orleanist um, heir, the Comte de Paris, the old Comte, uh, was very close to de Gaulle and was very Republican in some ways and then did a lot of stupid things. So he lost a lot of support to his own behavior, just as the legitimist side was now presenting a more passable air. All right. So then what happened? Well, what then happened was that he died. Alphonse died in 1989. Freak accident. He was beheaded. His son, the Duc d'Anjou, Louis XX, Louis XX, uh, has become the focus of a much larger and much more uh, active, legitimate side of uh, French royalism. Uh, they were helped, as I say, by the missteps of the House of Orléans, who disaffected a number of their followers. The old Comte de Paris dies. His son, who divorced his wife and did some various other things, was close to the Freemasons for a while. It really turned off a lot of people. But pulled himself together and became a much more credible candidate. And then... Uh, he died, I guess, three years ago. But here's the funny thing. A few months before he died, he attempted to consecrate France to the Sacred Heart, which, I mean, as far as the Genoese are concerned, is nice, but uh, since he wasn't the rightful king, it wouldn't matter. But it's a nice try. And also the um, legitimist there said he would love to do it, but only with all the bishops of France whereas the counterparty attempted to do it as a solo deal. But he put the Sacred Heart on the coat of arms and everything that uh, St. Margaret Marie Alacroix could ask for. Well, then, on January the 21st, a couple of years ago, he was getting ready to go to the annual mass, uh, the Requiem Mass for Louis XVI. And he suddenly felt unwell so he didn't go, and then he died. So his son Jean, the Duc de Vendôme, became uh, Count of Paris and heir to the Orleans claims. So now you have Louis the Twentieth or Jean II, Louis the Twentieth or John or John the uh, Second, the Duke of Anjou, the Count of Paris, the Count de Paris. So. What are the strengths and weaknesses? Well, without a doubt, uh, the Duc d'Anjou is the senior heir of the House of Bourbon. Now that has been established by the French courts. There's no question of it. Uh, his opponents would say, well, yes, but the Treaty of Utrecht would preclude his becoming king. Well, the problem with that, of course, is the Treaty of Utrecht was meant to keep one man from being king of France and Spain. Uh, and because his grandfather renounced his rights to Spain, he's a Frenchman, even though he was born in Spain and all that. Um, contrary wise, uh, the Count de Paris, who after his father died, all mention of the Secretary of the Sacred Heart vanished from the website and everything. Uh, nevertheless, he certainly is the head of the House of Orléans, and, uh, you know, if, if, if the, if the Duc d'Anjou is not the rightful king of France, then the Comte de Paris is. Uh, politically, they have a lot in common. They both came out against gay marriage. 
they both came out uh, in support of the yellow the yellow vests and l'action francaise particularly because of uh, the founder Charles Maurras's deep nationalism have always supported the house of orleans precisely because they are indisputably french uh, and i like l'action francaise but i'm a legitimist um, that being said though i know that um, the Conde de Paris got into a fight with the Fondation Saint Louis, who the holding company his grandfather created for the remaining family property. And they basically evicted him from his own home. And that I think is a terrible thing. Uh, I'm not a supporter of him as King of France, but I certainly support his right to his family's properties. And there we have it.